modern day era driving you up a wall? Time travel not likely in your future? Then follow me for a healthy offering of yesteryear with old time radio theater. Your remedy for unwanted 21st century pain. The Soul Twin Audio Network and Zangathor Studios brings you a recreation of CBS Radio Workshop's The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exprie, adapted as a radio play by Frank Tosi and starring J.S. Farrington as The Aviator and Dorothy Farrington as The Little Prince. Years ago, I had an accident with my plane in the Sahara Desert. Something was broken in the engine. Being alone, I set myself to attempt the difficult repairs. It was a question of life or death. I had only enough drinking water to last about a week. Now, the first night, I went to sleep on the sand, a thousand miles from any human habitation. So you can imagine my amazement when at sunrise I was awakened by an odd little voice. If you please, draw me a shape. What? Draw me a shape. I jumped to my feet, completely thunderstruck. I saw the most extraordinary small person who stood examining me with great seriousness. When I was able to speak, I said, What are you doing here? If you please, draw me a shape. I, I don't know how to draw. That doesn't matter. Draw me a shape. When I was only six, I had drawn a picture of a boa constrictor from the outside, digesting an elephant. The grown-ups couldn't understand it. They told me it looked like a hat. They advised me to lay aside my drawing and devote myself to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. Well, I did, because it's tiresome for children to be always and forever explaining things to them. Would you please draw me a sheep? The little fellow was so insistent, I took out my pen and some paper. Now, since I'd never drawn a sheep, I drew for him my picture of the boa constrictor that looked like a hat. No, no, no. I do not want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is very dangerous, and an elephant is cumbersome. Where I live, everything is very small. What I need is a shape. Please draw me one. I made several attempts. And then, being in a hurry to start working on my engine, I tossed off a drawing of a box and explained that the sheep was inside. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think this sheep will require a great deal of grass? There will surely be enough. It's a very small sheep I've given you. Not so small. Look, look through the air hole. My sheep has gone to sleep. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. It was only from words dropped by chance that little by little everything was revealed to me. I learned, for example, that the little prince came from another planet and that his planet was scarcely larger than a house. Now, I should remind the grown-ups that, in addition to the great planets, there are hundreds of others, some too small to be seen through telescopes, called asteroids, which are designated by numbers. The planet the little prince came from is asteroid B612. As each day passed, I would learn more about the little prince's planet. On the third day, I heard about the catastrophe of the baobabs. Is it true that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, yes, that's true. Then it follows they also eat baobabs. Baobabs? But it would take a herd of elephants to eat anything as gigantic as a baobab. Before they grow so big, don't baobabs start out by being little? Uh, entirely correct. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? I know a planet inhabited by a very lazy man. He neglected three little bushes. What happened? Catastrophe! The baobabs spread over the entire planet, tore clean through it with their roots, split it in pieces. Ah, so you must be careful. It is a question of discipline. I must attend to my planet each morning as I do myself. It's tedious. I need the sheep. On the fifth day, thanks to the sheep, the secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. If a sheep eats little bushes, does it eat flowers too? Sheep, 
<clears throat> eats anything it finds in its reach. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. <sighs> the thorns? What you saw then? <clears throat> Don't you ever let go of question what you've asked it? <sighs> Can't you see I'm busy fixing my plane? There's so little drinking water left. I must finish the repairs. But you haven't answered my question. All right, all right. The thorns are of no use at all. Flowers have thorns just for spite. Oh, I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They're naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons, and you actually believe that no, the flowers are... No, no, I don't believe anything. I answered you the first thing that came into my head. Don't you see I'm very busy with matters of consequence? Matters of consequence? You you talk just like the grown-ups. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. It is not a matter of consequence to try to understand why the flowers go to so much trouble to grow thorns which are never of any use to them. Now, just a moment. I, I knew one flower which is unique in all the universe, which grows nowhere but on my planet, which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite some morning without even noticing what he's doing? You think that is not important? <laughs> I... I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize. Now, the flower you love is not in danger. I'll draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw you a railing to put around your flower. I didn't know what else to say to him. Night had fallen, and I'd let my tools drop from my hand. And of what moment was my hammer or thirst or death? There was a little prince to be comforted. I felt awkward in my blundering. I... I didn't know how I could reach him. It's such a secret place, the Land of Tears. Oh, oh. I'm scarcely awake. I beg that you will excuse me. My petals are all still disarranged. Oh, how beautiful you are. Am I not? And I was born at the same moment as the sun. If you would have the kindness to think of my needs. You see how brilliant my four thorns are? Let the tigers come with their claws. There are no tigers on my planet. Besides, tigers do not eat weeds. I am not a weed. Please excuse me. I am not at all afraid of tigers. But I have a horror of drafts. I suppose you wouldn't have a scream for me. A horror of drafts. That is bad luck for a plant. This flower is a very complex creature. At night, I want you to put me under a glass globe. It is very cold where you live. Goodbye. <coughs> I have been silly. I ask your forgiveness. Try to be happy. <laughs> Of course I love you. It is my fault you have not known it all the while. That is of no importance. But you, you have been just as foolish as I. Try to be happy. Let the glass blow be. <coughs> I don't want it anymore. But the wind! My cold is not as bad as all that. The cool night air will do me good. I am a flower. But the animals! Well, I must endure the presence of two or three caterpillars if I wish to become acquainted with the butterflies. It seems that they are very beautiful. And if not the butterflies, then the caterpillars. Who will call upon me? You will be far away. As for the large animals, I am not at all afraid of any of them. I have my claws. Don't linger like this. You have decided to go away. Now go! So that's why you left your tiny home on asteroid B612. It was love. Love for a flower. A flower unique in all the universe. At first I was captivated by her beauty. Very quickly she began to torment me with her vanity, and I soon came to doubt her. Was she the only flower on your planet? Oh no! 
But the others are very simple. They take up no room, cause not one bit of trouble. Your flower was different. Very. She came from a seed blown to my planet from who knows where. From the moment she first showed herself, she became demanding. She commanded all of my time, even the time that I had always devoted to the baobabs and my volcanoes. Volcanoes? I have two active volcanoes, very convenient for heating my breakfast. I carefully clean them out every morning. If they are well cleaned out, volcanoes burn steadily and slowly without eruptions. I see. I also have one volcano that is extinct. I clean it out too. One never knows. No? One never knows. You were telling me about your flower. I ought to have never run away from her. I ought to have judged her by deeds, not by words. I ought to have guessed that behind her poor little stratagems lay real affection for me. But I was too young to know how to love her. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. And so it was that the little prince fled from the proud flower he loved, but could not understand. To escape his planet, the little prince took advantage of the migration of a flock of wild birds. He found himself in the neighborhoods of asteroids number 325, 326, 27, 28, and 329. He began to visit them in order to add to his knowledge. The first asteroid was inhabited by a king clad in a royal purple and ermine, who was seated upon a magic throne. The king was elated when he saw the little prince coming. Ah, a subject. Approach so that I may see you better. The king felt exceedingly proud to at least be a king over somebody. The little prince looked everywhere for a place to sit down, but the entire planet was crammed and obstructed by the king's magnificent robe. So he remained standing, and since he was tired, he yawned. <sighs> It is contrary to etiquette to yawn in the presence of a king. I forbid you to do so. I can't help it. I have come on a long journey and have had no sleep. Ah, then. Uh, I order you to yawn. Yes. Come now, yawn again. That's an order. That frightens me. I cannot anymore. Well, then I order you sometimes to yawn and sometimes not to. Look here. I insist that my authority be respected. I tolerate no disobedience. I am an absolute monarch. However, I always make my orders uh, reasonable. That is very wise. Oh, of course. If I ordered a general to change himself into a um, seabird, and he did not, it would be my fault, not his. May I sit down? Yes. I order you to do so. Here, I shall move my rope. Sire, I beg that you'll excuse me asking a question. I order you to ask me a question. Sire, you are alone here. This planet is tiny. Over what do you rule? Over everything. Over everything? You mean all the other planets and all the stars? Oh, over all that. Oh, that's marvelous. You can see a sunset whenever you wish. Oh, Sire, I should like to see a sunset. Do me that kindness. Order the sun to set. Oh, if I ordered a general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, or write uh, a tragic drama, or change himself into a seabird, and he did not, which of us would be wrong? You. Exactly. One must require from each one only the duty he can perform. I have the right to require obedience, because my orders are reasonable. But my sunset... You shall have it. I shall command it. When, sire? Hmm? Hmm. Ah, hmm. I shall consult my almanac. Hmm. I, uh... Ah, here we are. That will be this evening, about 20 minutes to eight. And when I give the order, you'll see how well I'm obeyed. I see. I have nothing more to do here, so I shall set out on my way again. Oh, do not go. Do, 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 do not go. I, 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 ah, ah. I'll make you a minister. Minister of what? Uh, minister of justice? Yes, that's it. Minister of justice. But there is nobody here to judge. Uh, oh, well, then you shall judge yourself. It's far more difficult to judge oneself 
than to judge others. I can judge myself anywhere. Um, ah, I have good reason to believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. You can judge this old rat. From time to time you will condemn him to death. Oh, you'll have to pardon him on each occasion. He must be treated thriftily. He's the only one we have. I wouldn't like that. I think I will go on my way. Oh no. I'm ready to depart. If your majesty wishes to be promptly obeyed, you should be able to give me a reasonable order. Oh, very well. I order you to be gone by the end of one minute. Conditions seem favorable. Oh, but here this. Uh, I, I make you my ambassador. The grown-ups are very strange. The second planet was inhabited by a conceited man, who thought the little prince had come to admire him. Ooh, I'm about to receive a visit from an admirer. Good morning. That's an odd hat you're wearing. It is a hat for salutes. I raise it in salute when people acclaim me. <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody at all ever passes this way. Oh? Clap your hands one against the other. All right. You see? Now I raise my hat in salute. Do it again. Thank you, thank you. Wouldn't you like to applaud me again? Well, no. But you really do admire me. What do you mean? Well, you regard me as the handsomest, the best dressed, the richest, and most intelligent man on this planet. <laughs> but you're the only man on your planet. Uh, do me this kindness. Admire me just the same. Very well. I admire you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And goodbye. Now, what is there that interests you so much? The grown-ups are certainly very odd. The third planet belonged to a businessman. This man was so much occupied that he did not even raise his head at the little prince's arrival. Five, five, and seven. Twelve, twelve, and three make fifteen. Good morning. Fifteen and seven make twenty-two. Twenty-two and six make twenty-eight. I haven't time to light it again. Twenty-six and five make thirty-one. Whew. And that makes 501,622,731. 501 million what? Huh? Are you still there? 501 million... I can't stop. I have so much to do. I am concerned with matters of consequence. I don't amuse myself with balderdash. 2 and 5 makes 7... 501 million what? <sighs> During the 54 years that I have inhabited this planet, I have been disturbed only three times. The first time was 22 years ago, when some giddy goose fell from goodness knows where. He made the most frightful noise that resounded all over the place, and I made four mistakes in my addition. The second time, 11 years ago, I was disturbed by an attack of rheumatism. I don't get enough exercise. I have no time for loafing. The third time, well, this is it. I was saying then, 501 millions. Millions of what? Millions of those little objects which one sometimes sees in the sky. Bats? Oh no, little glittering objects. These? Oh no, little golden objects that set lazy men to idle dreaming. As for me, I am concerned with matters of consequence. There is no time for idle dreaming in my life. Ah, you mean the stars? Yes, that's it. The stars. And what do you do with 500 million stars? 501,622,731. I am concerned with matters of consequence. I am accurate. And what do you do with these stars? What do I do with them? Yes. Nothing. I own them. You own the stars? Yes. But 
I've already seen a king. Kings do not own, they reign over. It's a very different matter. And what good does it do you to own the stars? It does me the good of making me rich. And what good does it do you to be rich? It makes it possible for me to buy more stars, if any are ever discovered. How is it possible for one to own the stars? To whom do they belong? I don't know. To nobody. Then they belong to me, because I was the first person to think of it. Is that all that is necessary? Certainly. When you find a diamond that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you discover an island that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you get an idea before anyone else, you take out a patent on it. It is yours. So with me, I own stars because nobody else before me ever thought of owning them. Yes, that is true. And what do you do with them? I administer them. I count them and recount them. It is difficult, but I am a man who is naturally interested in matters of consequence. If I owned a silk scarf, I could put it around my neck and take it away with me. If I owned a flower, I could pluck that flower and take it away with me. But you cannot pluck the stars from heaven. No, but I can put them in the bank. Whatever does that mean? That means that I write the number of my stars on a little paper, and then I put this paper in a drawer and lock it with a key. And that is all? That is enough. It is entertaining. It is rather poetic. But it is of no great consequence. Your ideas of matters of consequence are quite different from grown-ups. I myself own a flower, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I clean out every week. It is of some use to my flower that I own, but you are of no use to the stars. Father Dash! Now, let's see, where was I? 342.77... The grown-ups are certainly altogether extraordinary. Tell me, how did you come to visit this planet, the Earth? It was recommended by a geographer on the fifth planet I visited. Do you like it? Do you intend to stay? It has been almost a year since I left my home, my flower, my volcanoes. I'm worried. Baobabs? I left them under control. Your flower, then? On my journey, I learned many things. I learned that flowers are in danger of speedy disappearance. Soon I must return. It had been eight days since my accident in the desert. The last drop of my water supply was gone. The little prince seemed to not guess the danger. A little sunshine was all he seemed to need. He was recounting some of his experiences after coming to our planet. I met a friend. He was a fox. My dear little man, this is no longer a matter. I could have anything to do with a fox. Why not? I am about to die of thirst. I'll tell you about it as we go, then. Come, let us look for a well. <laughs> it's absurd to look for a well at random in the immensity of the desert. When I arrived on the Earth, I was surprised not to see any people. It was explained to me that I'd landed on the desert. Your friend the fox told you this? No, it was a little gold-colored snake. What planet is this on which I've come down? This is Earth. This is Africa. Oh, did there are no people on the Earth? This is the desert. There are no people in the desert. The Earth is large. I wonder whether the stars are set alight in heaven so that one day each one of us may find his own again. Look at my planet. It's right there above us. But how far away it is. It is beautiful. What has brought you here? I've been having some trouble with the flower. Ah. Where are the men? It's a little lonely in the desert. It is also lonely among men. 
You're a funny animal. You are no thicker than a finger. But I am more powerful than the finger of a king. You're not very powerful. You haven't eaten any feet. You cannot even travel. I can carry you farther than any ship could take you. Whomever I touch, I send back to the earth from whence he came. But you... You are innocent and true. And you come from a star. You move me to pity. You're so weak on this earth made of granite. I can help you someday. If you grow too homesick for your own planet, I can... Oh, I understand you very well. But why do you always speak in riddles? <laughs> I solve them all. A little yellow snake. But they're deadly. Not deadly. She could have struck you fatally. She told me she could help me someday if I ever felt homesick for my planet. All I need to do is return to the place where I descended and she would meet me there. Are you homesick then? It is very close to the anniversary of my arrival. At that time, my planet will be right overhead. I... I should be unhappy if you go. That is what the fox said. It was his fault. He wanted me to tame him. Come and play with me. I'm so unhappy. I, I cannot play with you. I'm not tamed. What does that mean, tame? Well, you do not live here. What is it that you are looking for? I'm looking for men. What does that mean? Tame. Men? They have guns and they hunt. It is very disturbing. They also raise chickens. These are their only interests. Are you looking for chickens? No, I'm looking for friends. What does that mean? Tame. It is an act too often neglected. It means to establish ties. To establish ties? Just that. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who is just like a hundred thousand other little boys. And I have no need of you. And you, on your part, have no need of me. To you, I am nothing more than a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world. To you, I shall be unique in all the world. I'm beginning to understand. There's a flower. I think that she has tamed me. It is possible. On the Earth, one sees all sorts of things. Oh, but this is not the Earth. On another planet? Yes. Are there hunters on this planet? No. Ah, that is interesting. Uh, are there chickens? No. <sighs> Nothing's perfect. My life is very monotonous. I hunt chickens, men hunt me. All the chickens are just alike, and all the men are just alike. And in consequence, I am a little bored. But if you tame me, it will be as if the sun came to shine on my life. I shall know the sound of a step that will be different from all the others. Other steps send me hurrying back underneath the ground. Yours will call me like music, out of my burrow, and then, look, you see the grain fields down yonder? I do not eat bread. Wheat is of no use to me. The wheat fields have nothing to say to me, and that is sad. But you have hair that is the color of gold. Think how wonderful that will be when you have tamed me. The grain, which is also golden, will bring me back the thought of you. And I shall love to listen to the wind in the wheat. Please, tame me. I want to, very much, but I do not have much time. I have friends to discover and a great many things to understand. One only understands the things that one tames. Men have no more time to understand anything. They buy things already made at the shops. 
but there is no shop anywhere where one can buy friendship, and so men have no friends anymore. If you want a friend, tame me. What must I do to tame you? You must be very patient. First, you will sit down at a little distance from me, like that, in the grass. I shall look at you out of the corner of my eye, and you will say nothing. Words are a source of misunderstandings, but you will sit a little closer to me every day. The next day, the little prince came back. It would have been better to come back at the same hour. If, for example, you come at four o'clock in the afternoon, then at three o'clock, I shall begin to be happy. I shall feel happier and happier as the hour advances. At four o'clock, I shall already be worrying and jumping about. I shall show you how happy I am. But if you come at just any time, I shall never know at what hour my heart is to be ready to greet you. One must observe the proper rites. What's a rite? Those are also actions too often neglected. They are what make one day different from other days, one hour from other hours. There is a rite, for example, among my hunters, Every Thursday, they dance with the village girls. So Thursday is a wonderful day for me. I can take a walk as far as the vineyards. But if the hunters danced at just any time, every day would be like every other day, and I should never have any vacation at all. So the little prince tamed the fox, and when the hour of his departure grew near... Ah! I shall cry. It's your own fault. I never wished you any sort of harm, but you wanted me to tame you. <laughs> yes, that is so. But now you're going to cry. Yes, that is so. Then it has done you no good at all. It has done me good because of the color of the wheat fields. Go and look again at the roses. You will understand now that yours is unique in all the world. Then. Come back to say goodbye to me, and I will make you a present of a secret. The fox wanted me to tame him to establish ties and make him different from all the other foxes. <sighs> I'm beginning to understand. I looked again at the roses. They were beautiful, but... One would not die for them. My rose is more important than all the others because it is she that I have watered. It is she that I have put under a glass globe, sheltered from the wind behind a screen. Listen to her when she grumbled or boasted. She's my rose. And your friend the fox? When I met him, he was as yet nothing. Just a fox like thousands of other foxes. But I've made him my friend. Now he is unique in all the world. You have learned a secret. A simple secret. It's only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Men have forgotten that you become responsible forever for what you've tamed. I am responsible for my rose. When we had trudged along for several hours in silence, the darkness fell and the stars came out. The little prince dropped off to sleep. I took him in my arms and set out walking once more. I felt the need of protecting him, as if he himself were a flame that might be extinguished by a little puff of wind. I walked on. I found the well at daybreak. you know, the muzzle for my sheep. Uh, uh, I remember. Uh, I'm afraid it's not very good. This will be all right. You have plans I don't know about. 
Tomorrow will be the anniversary of my descent to the Earth. And your star will be just above. You must return to your work on the engine now. I will be waiting here. Come back tomorrow evening. I'm a little frightened. Remember the fox. One runs the risk of weeping a little if one lets himself be tamed. I was not reassured. I did not want to lose my little friend. I pretended to go, but hid behind a rock. I could not see to whom the little prince was speaking. I remembered. This is the exact spot, the right time. You have good poison. You are sure you will not make me suffer for too long? My heart jumped to my throat. I looked around the rock. Before me, facing the little prince, was one of those yellow snakes that take just 30 seconds to end your life. I dug into my pocket for my pistol and started to run. The snake let herself flow past the sand like the dying spray of a fountain, and disappeared among the stones. What does this mean? Why are you talking with snakes? You will find out what is wrong with your engine today, and you can go back home. I too am going home today. It is much farther, much more difficult. I want you to stay a while longer. I have your sheep, and the sheep's box, and I have the muzzle. Little man, I, I want to hear you laugh again. It tell me it's only a bad dream, this uh, affair with the snake, the meeting place, the star. At night, you will look up at the stars. My star will be just one of the stars for you. You'll love to watch all of the stars in the heavens. They'll be your friends. <laughs> I'm making you a present. Little prince. Oh, dear little prince. I love to hear that laughter. That is my present. Just that. What are you trying to say? For most people, the stars are silent. You, you alone, will have the stars as no one else has them. I don't understand. In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. It will be as if all the stars were laughing when you look at the night sky. Only you will have the stars that can laugh. I too shall look at the stars. They will all be wells with rusty pulleys. You will have 500 million little bells, and I shall have 500 million springs of fresh water. Now, let me go by myself. You... you're afraid, little friend. I am responsible for my flower. She's so weak, so naive. She has four thorns of no use at all. Don't go. Please. Don't go. I seemed unable to move. The little prince hesitated, took one step, and there was nothing there except a flash of yellow close to his ankle. He remained motionless for an instant. He did not cry out. He fell gently as a tree falls. There wasn't even any sound because of the sand. Now years and years have gone by. Until now, I've never told this story. My sorrow is comforted a little, not entirely. But I do know that he went back to his planet. His body was not there at daybreak. At night, I love to listen to the stars. It's like 500 million little bells. But there's one extraordinary thing. When I drew the muzzle for the little prince, I forgot to add the leather strap to it. He will never have been able to fasten it to his sheep, so now I keep wondering what's happening on his planet. Perhaps the sheep has eaten the flower, and the little bells are changed to tears. <sighs> Here, then, is a great mystery. Nothing in the universe can be the same if somewhere a sheep that we have never seen has, yes or no, eaten a rose, and no grown-up will ever understand that this is a matter of such importance.
This recreation of CBS Radio Workshop's The Little Prince was produced and directed by Rachel Pulliam from the Soul Twin Audio Network and Jonas Fair from Zangathor Studios. Featured in our cast in order of appearance were J.S. Farrington as The Aviator, Dorothy Farrington as The Little Prince, Alexa Chipman as The Rose, Jerry Kokich as The King, John Bell as The Conceited Man, Josh Medlock as The Businessman, Sharon Grunwald as The Snake, and Dean T. Moody as The Fox. All theme and incidental music was composed by Ross Bernhardt, with animation by Kat Ruiz, and editing and storyboard by Nall from Zangathor Studios. Special thanks to Felt and The Witch Project. This is your announcer, Dean T. Moody. Thank you for watching.